the second lecture of term for metaphysics. Uh, so this week we're going to be discussing uh, solutions, possible solutions to the problem posed in last week's lecture and reading. So the problem was the problem of change or the problem of temporary intrinsics. Uh, so this apparent tension between, on the one hand, the notion that ordinary objects uh, persist as a matter of diachronic identity uh, over time. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the idea that Leibniz's law is true, which says that if A and B are identical, uh, then A and B share all their properties. Now, these seem to be in tension uh, because it seems that ordinary objects, in fact, change their properties over time. So, for instance, we compared the young and old Ian McKellen and noticed that in various respects, uh, both intrinsic and extrinsic or relational, uh, the young Ian McKellen seems to differ from the old Ian McKellen. But how can this be by Leibniz's law if uh, young Ian McKellen and old Ian McKellen are one and the same person? So we're going to look at some um, philosophical attempts, metaphysical attempts to uh, deal with this uh, apparent paradox in this, this lecture. So what I'm going to do now is just uh, switch to the, the slides um, so that you can follow a bit more easily. Um, let me just put those into uh, full screen. Um, so the the title of this lecture is uh, Temporal Parts. Uh, so this is one of the uh, prominent uh, solutions uh, to the problem of change. Um, we'll also look at others uh, by way of contrast to uh, this temporal part solution. Um, okay, so this is just the sort of setup. So it seems that one and the same numerically identi identical object can change, at least sort of intuitively we think of, you know, it still being Ian McKellen, for instance, uh, in spite of the changes he's undergone. Uh, so it seems that... Um, in other words, Ian McKellen, one and the same person, uh, for instance, can have different properties at different times. And as I noted uh, just a minute ago, this seems in tension with uh, what's known as Leibniz's law, the indiscernibility of identicals, which says that X is that if X is identical to Y, then X and Y have exactly the same properties. And this, as I said, is known as the problem of change, sometimes called the problem of temporary intrinsics. Uh, David Lewis, I think, was the first to use this term. But I think um, problem of temporary intrinsics, although it's widely used uh, as a name for this issue, um, is somewhat misleading because I. Uh, it seems to me that it doesn't specifically have to do with the intrinsic properties. Um, extrinsic or relational properties are just as problematic in this regard. Okay, so when it comes to attempts to solve uh, this apparent paradox, this tension between the notion that ordinary objects persist identically across time, that ordinary objects change, and Leibniz's law, which says that um, uh, uh, identical objects must share all of the same properties, um, there are, I guess, two sort of mainstream approaches to to trying to reconcile these three principles. So other other responses are possible, right? So one could simply reject one of the propositions that leads to the apparent contradiction. So the, there are three propositions, essentially. The, the proposition that ordinary objects persist identically over time, uh, that ordinary objects change, uh, or that Leibniz's law is true. Now, it seems quite difficult to reject change, right? So this seems to be something that is uh, empirically observable in our experience. So I don't think many people go down that route, uh, that ordinary objects simply don't change. Um, rejecting Leibniz's law um, is has also not been a popular move. So uh, I think people have, have taken this to be sufficiently plausible and sufficiently central to our thinking about identity um, that they've tended not to reject this. Um, 
So if we're going to reject one of the three principles, possibly the rejection of the principle that ordinary objects persist identically over time is uh, the most plausible approach, and some people have indeed taken that approach. So we could simply uh, deny um, that they do. Um, we could say, you know, look, any change in intrinsic or relational properties is enough to destroy identity. Um, and some philosophers have taken that approach. Uh, for instance, Derek Parfit famously took this approach when it comes to the identity of persons or alleged identity of persons across time. Um, however, I, this then sort of incurs the burden of um, explaining why uh, we talk and think of objects as identical over time. Uh, despite the fact that on this view, it's false that they're identical across time. And perhaps for that reason, perhaps because this notion that ordinary objects can survive change, um, that it's, for instance, Ian McKellen, who was used to be young and now is old, um, uh, people have preferred, if they can, not to reject any of the principles and to seek a reconciliation of them. So. Um, we will we will look at uh, these two main uh, traditions of attempting, if you like, to to both have one's cake and eat it, as the saying goes, um, in the sense of uh, preserving uh, identity across change um, as well as Leibniz's law, and arguing that maybe they're not incompatible after all. So one, one, of, one tradition is known as endurantism, sometimes three-dimensionalism. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, another is perdurantism or four-dimensionalism. So these are, roughly speaking, technical terms uh, that are just used in the literature to, to designate these two traditions. Um, so perdurantism or four-dimensionalism is the view that objects, ordinary objects, are four-dimensional. Um, I guess ordinarily we might think of them as three-dimensional, as just having uh, three spatial dimensions. Uh, but perdurantism claims that actually they are additionally extended in time, so they have an additional temporal dimension. So the perdurantist argues that ordinary objects have temporal parts as well as spatial parts. Uh, and they would claim that persistence, uh, sort of existence identically across time, involves having parts, temporal parts, located at different times. Um, so it follows that only a part, a temporal part of a persisting object, is present at any given time during its existence. Endurantism, again, putting it abstractly, um, is the... Converse view, the, the view that objects, ordinary objects, are uh, merely three-dimensional, that is to say they're extended in the three spatial dimensions but not in time, so this might be thought a more common sense view, more ordinary, intuitive view. Um, they claim that persisting objects uh, therefore have spatial parts but they don't have temporal parts. Um, or in other words, that an object is wholly present uh, at any time at which it exists. Um, nevertheless, endurantists don't want to deny identical persistence through time, uh, but rather they take this identity across time as primitive and irreducible. So in particular, it's not reducible to having uh, different temporal parts located at different times because they deny that there are such parts. Okay, so the I guess, you know, in terms of the cartoon, you could think of, um, according to the perjurantist, the, uh, a person uh, is going to uh, comprise all of these stages, um, these sort of temporal parts, the, the, the baby temporal part, the old man temporal part, uh, and everything in between. Uh, so a four-dimensional object, sometimes known as a, uh, a worm, four-dimensional worm. Um, the idea is that uh, it. I, I suppose that uh, uh, it, it, something like a person will have quite a long temporal extent. Um, by contrast, their their spatial extent might be rather limited. Um, so th it, they they sort of uh, are kind of worm-like when you take into account this fourth dimension. Um, the 
Endurantist, on the other hand, is going to think that, you know, it's not the whole um, worm, it's not all of these stages that uh, uh, constitute the, the, the person, um, but rather uh, each one of these stages individually constitutes the person at a given time. Um, so uh, the person is merely three-dimensional and not four-dimensional. Okay, so let's sort of try and make a bit more sense of the perjurantist view. Um, so the perjurantist in sort of, I suppose, explaining and starting to defend their view uh, might give an analogy with events. Now, uh, the idea here is that we're pretty used to talking and thinking about events as four-dimensional, even if this is uh, a bit more unusual when it comes to uh ordinary objects. So, um, for instance, take an event like a football match. Um, it seems fair to say that ordinarily we regard uh, such an event as temporally extended. So, for instance, a football match persists for uh, 90 minutes, plus, I guess, injury time and so on. Um, it has, I think, it's reasonable to say temporal parts. So, we might talk about the first half of the football match, the second half of the football match, the 77th minute of the football match, and so on. And we tend to think of events uh, that are temporally extended as not wholly present at any given time, right? So we don't think that, the, for instance, the whole of the football match is present in the 77th minute. So... Perjurantists are just extending this way of thinking to objects. Um, so normally they'll say that objects have instantaneous temporal parts. Um, so, for instance, the Eiffel Tower um, at 12 noon on the 1st of July 1900, say. Uh, that would be an instantaneous part of the larger object that is the Eiffel Tower. So... It's going to be the case not only that they have instantaneous temporal parts, but they also have potentially temporally extended uh, temporal parts. So, for instance, uh, we could consider the Eiffel Tower throughout 1900 the whole, for the whole year. Um, that would be a temporally extended temporal part of the Eiffel Tower. But it is only a part um, because, after all, the Eiffel Tower has other parts uh, located at different years, for instance. So basically, you can sort of break down, at least on this sort of standard uh, perjurantist view, you can break down the temporal parts of objects into smaller, smaller tem temporal parts. So, for instance, the uh, extended temporal part of the Eiffel Tower th that exists throughout 1900 um, has uh, the part that exists at precisely 12 noon on uh, the 1st of July 1900 as, as a part. So this is sort of by analogy to the, the way in which objects have spatial parts and those spatial parts may be further subdivided. So, for instance, uh, your right hand is a spatial part of you and that in turn has further uh, parts. Uh, for instance, uh, your the, the small, the little, little finger on your, your right hand. Okay, so for the perjurantist, then, um, change, they're going to understand change as a difference between temporal parts. So, for instance, uh, the world's largest tree, uh, a California redwood, um, is known as Hyperion. And Hyperion is reckoned to be 800 or so years old. Um, so there's a photo of it on the right. And... Uh, the tree at the moment is approximately 116 metres tall. Um, on the other hand, you know, we might suppose that, say, on Christmas Day in the year 1200, uh, when Hyperion was a mere sapling, um, that it was, say, one metre tall. Now, this, you know, just a different illustration to the Ian McKellen one, but basically the same same issue, Um there's been change, right? So, for instance, there's been change in the height property of Hyperion. So, uh, Hyperion used to be uh, one meter tall and is now 116 meters tall. So, the question is, uh, does does this contradict Leibniz's law? Do we uh, do we have a, a problem here? 
um, because it seems that although we want to say these are one and the same tree, Hyperion, uh, young Hyperion had this property of being one meter tall, whereas uh, uh, Hyperion now has uh, this apparently uh, incompatible property of being 116 meters tall. Now, so the strategy that the perjurantist is going to use to avoid this problem of change is to say that being one meter tall and being 116 meters tall aren't actually, as we might initially think, properties of a single object, namely the object Hyperion, the tree Hyperion, um, but rather they're properties of two different objects, uh, namely two different temporal parts of Hyperion. Um, so the idea is that these properties that are, are, are temporary um, and changeable are not properties of the object per se, but they're properties of the temporal parts of the object. So the idea is that while it might be genuinely consistent for one and sorry, genuinely inconsistent for one and the same object to be both one meter tall and 116 meters tall, it's not inconsistent uh, for parts of this object, temporal parts, uh, to have individually these two properties. Um, so, I guess you, you could, again, use a, uh analogy with spatial parts. So, it somehow seems problematic to say, for instance, I'm both freckled and not freckled. Um, that seems like a contradiction. But if we said, well, my right hand is freckled, but my left hand is unfreckled, that doesn't seem like a contradiction at all. So, one of my parts has a property that another part lacks, um, that seems unproblematic in the, the, the spatial parts case. So the perjurantist will also claim that it's unproblematic in the temporal parts case. So what do we think about this? Is this a, a, a good solution to the problem of change? Well, um, I suppose we've sort of seen its virtues. It at least appears to, to maybe get around the contradiction or the apparent contradiction between Leibniz's law and uh, the idea that ordinary objects change over time. Um, but I suppose it might be objected that really this this doesn't provide the sort of magical solution that, that we might have hoped for, um, because you might argue that really the perjurantist's uh, alleged solution actually ends up simply denying change, uh, which is one of the things that we, we said at the start might be thought rather implausible. So you might argue that uh, perjurantism implies that actually objects don't have properties that change, right? So actually what happens is they consist of different temporal parts that have different properties. The temporal parts themselves don't change, Right, so they the temporal parts just have the properties that they do. I mean, it's true that they um, might consist of smaller temporal parts that that themselves have different properties, but that that's all that sort of the alleged change involved uh, that the perjurantist allows for consists in. It just consists in having different temporal parts with different properties, and you might think that that's not not real change. Uh, real change would be one and the same object uh, possessing uh, properties that changed rather than just having different parts that, that have different properties. So you might think that this isn't really a, a reconciliation of change with identity across time, uh, but rather simply a denial of change. Uh, and you might argue that that's contrary to common sense. Of course, the perjurantist is going to come back and say, look, you know, my notion of change, that is of... Um, Having parts with different properties is a perfectly re reasonable notion of change, um, and they're going to defend their view that way. So they might, um, I mean, you can think of a, an analogy with um, spatial parts, right? So if you think of a river, uh, a river might, st uh, near the source, it might be narrow and fast flowing, and near the mouth, it might be wide and slow flowing. Um, now, you, one thing we might say, so these are, this is a case of different spatial parts having different properties. So uh, the, the bit near the source has properties that the, the bit near the mouth lacks. 
Now, I suppose we might speak of the river changing in its nature over its course, right? So it goes from near the source being narrow and fast flowing to near the mouth being uh, wide and slow flowing. And, you know, the, the, this is sort of grist to the mill of the perjurantist. They're going to say, great, you know, this is, this is a, a notion of change and this is precisely what I'm saying happens in the uh, uh, cross-time case too. Um, but the endurantist, or at least the, the critic of perjurantism, might say, well, you know, when we say that the river changes over its course, that's only a kind of, you know, way of speaking. It's only figurative. Uh, nothing's really changing. It's just that the different spatial parts have different properties. Uh, and likewise, they might claim that uh, the perjurantist doesn't give us a genuine notion of change. OK, so before, I suppose, deciding whether we want to pursue four-dimensionalism, that is perjurantism, any further, we might uh, reasonably want to consider uh, rival approaches. So, as I said, the, uh, a main rival approach is endurantism or three-dimensionalism. Um, so, actually, the endurantism is a kind of broad tradition consisting of various versions that uh, different philosophers have subscribed to. Um, so, I suppose, sort of broadly speaking, you could say um, that the, the at least the most well known versions of endurantism are presentism, relationism, and adverbialism. So we'll go into what those are. So presentism is the view that actually the only things that exist are those that exist in the present, right? So obviously, I think obviously on this view, um, ordinary objects can't consist of temporal parts. Uh, because only the present moment exists. So past and future temporal parts just don't exist, right? So it seems they can't uh, take a temporal parts view. So according to the presentist, because only the present moment exists and only the, the things that exist in the present moment exist, um, the only properties that objects possess are those that they possess now, right? Because it's only their current states that exist. So according to the presentist, they're going to say, well, look, Hyperion, or at least it seems they're going to say Hyperion doesn't have the property of being one meter tall on Christmas Day 1200. It only has the property of being 116 meters tall uh, on the present day, right? Because just this past state of Hyperion simply doesn't exist. Um, so this, I suppose, seems to avoid the problem of change entirely um, because we don't have this problem of reconciling uh, the one meter state of Hyperion with its 116 meter state because only the 116 meter state exists. So I suppose this may also lead to an objection, right? So you might say, well, look, uh, uh, um, it seems that According to presentism, change doesn't really happen at all. Uh, and indeed, our, you might argue that according to presentism, objects don't persist through time, right? So there's no tree uh, that exists on uh, Christmas Day 1200 um, that Hyperion is identical to, right? Because the, the year 1200 and all of the things in it don't exist, according to the presentist. Um so it just looks like there are no past and future states of any object. Um, and presumably change would involve uh, the existence of differing past and future states of an object. So if those simply don't exist, then arguably we don't have change at all. Um, and you might think, well, you know, denying this kind of persistence over time, it, uh, denying that uh, uh, Hyperion, for instance, uh, is identical to things that exist in the past and the future, uh, denying that there are these different states of Hyperion, uh, you might think is is not plausible. So that's a sort of objection that will be leveled against um, uh, presentism. What about relationism? So this is another version of endurantism. Um, so relationism 
says that well Hyperion doesn't uh, so we might uh, we we earlier distinguished between uh intrinsic properties and extrinsic properties um so things like height on the face of them you know would would normally think of as intrinsic properties so they're not they're not relations that an object bears to another object um so we might think uh look hyperion uh it's an intrinsic property of hyperion that it's 116 meters tall a relational property would be that it's taller than every other tree right so that you can't tell just by considering hyperion in itself uh, but you'd have to compare it to 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 other objects, other trees that exist. Um, but actually, relationism denies this. It denies that um, being 116 meters tall is indeed an intrinsic property, uh, and rather claims it's extrinsic. And in particular, as the name relationism suggests, that it's a relation. So Hyperion doesn't have the intrinsic property of being 116 meters tall, but rather bears a relation, um, the being 116 metres tall on relation, to a time, to a certain time, um, the present day. So, uh, I guess, uh, January 17th, 2022, for instance. On the other hand, it bears the being one metre tall on relation, say, to Christmas Day uh, 1200, the year 1200. Um, and the claim would be that, look, these two relations are compatible, right? So it doesn't simply have the property of being 116, like an in, if it had an intrinsic property of being 116 metres tall and an intrinsic property of being one metre tall, then it seems that we'd have a problem. But they'll argue um, that there's no contradiction between it having the, uh, or bearing the being 116 metres tall on relation to one time, and the being one meter tall on relation to another time. So you could sort of compare this to uh, spatial relations, for instance. So you could say that, um, well, you know, look, there's no contradiction um, between my bearing the relation, the spatial relation of being three miles uh, from to Big Ben uh, and being 300 miles from bearing that relation to the Eiffel Tower, right? It would be a contradiction if I bore those two relations to the same thing, presumably. Um, but uh, the fact that I bear them to different things means that those two relations are compatible. And uh, so they're going to say that um, uh, it's compatible that Hyperion should bear the being 160 metres tall on relation to one uh, time and the being one metre tall on relation to another time. Now, okay, so in, interesting view, I suppose. Um, what might be some objections to it? Well, one sort of objection is that it seems to imply that objects have no intrinsic properties, or at least a lot fewer than we would ordinarily think. So in order for this solution to work, they're going to have to claim that um, every changeable property, everything that seems to be a changeable intrinsic property of an object is actually really a relation to a time, right? So things that can change like height and, and weight and color and so on, they're all going to be relations to times. And you might wonder whether the sort of notion, the, the notion of an object um, that's devoid of intrinsic properties that just stands in relations, or at least maybe almost devoid of intrinsic properties, um, uh, whether that's a coherent notion. Okay. Now, another objection to relationism, which I, I guess in, in a way is similar to an objection we saw to... Uh, to perjurantism and also to presentism is that you could argue that relationism too denies that there's really change um, and this seems rather counterintuitive so um, the objection would say that actually you know there's no real change on the relationist picture because objects don't possess changeable properties rather they just stand in relations to times and these relations are permanent so Hyperion permanently stands in the relation of 
being one metre tall on uh, to Christmas Day, uh, the year 1200, and the uh, permanently uh, bears the uh, relation of uh, being 116 metres tall on uh, to the to uh, whatever the current date is. So I think it's the 12th, 12th of January, uh, as I speak, um, 2022. Okay, so... Um, okay, so, so those are some objects to relationism. So let's consider the final version of endurantism, and that's known as uh, adverbialism. Um, so this is perhaps... Um, I don't know. It's maybe the strangest view. Uh, at least that, that 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 that's that's my in my opinion. It's the, it's the strangest of all the views we've considered. Um, so, adverbialism is the idea that if we say that Hyperion is one hundred and sixteen meters tall on, well, it's actually January the twelfth as I speak, uh, January the twelfth, twenty two twenty twenty two then this expression, January the 12th, 2022, functions as an adverb, right? So another example of an adverb, and maybe a more familiar sort of adverb, is quickly. So if I say bolt runs quickly, um, then uh, quickly, the word quickly, is an adverb. Um, it's saying, um, it's modifying the verb to run. Uh, so it's saying, you know, the saying something about the manner in which uh, Bolt runs. So, um, for the adverbialist, these temporal expressions, um, contrary to you know how they first appear, similarly function as adverbs. So, if I say Hyperion is 160 metres on January the 12th, 2022, uh, then this expression January the 12th, 2022 is functioning as an adverb. So what I'm saying is that Hyperion is 116 metres tall in a certain sort of way, in a January the 12th, 2022 sort of way. Uh, just like when I say Bolt runs quickly, what I'm saying is that Bolt runs in a certain sort of way, namely a quick way. Um, likewise, Hyperion is, uh, if I say Hyperion, is one meter tall on Christmas Day uh, in the year 1200. I'm saying Hyperion, according to this view, I'm saying Hyperion is one meter tall in a Christmas Day 1200 sort of way. So, I I mean, I think, you know, one objection to this view. So, the, I, well, I mean, I should say, of course, the idea is going to be that uh, uh, it's compatible for Hyperion to be 116 metres tall uh, in a January 12th, 2022 sort of way, um, and one metre tall in a uh, Christmas Day year 1200 sort of way. So I suppose it, uh, on this view it would be a contradiction if Hyperion was both 116, was, was 116 metres tall and one metre tall in the same sort of way, in, say, a Christmas Day 1200 sort of way, uh, the adverbialist would think that was a genuine contradiction. But the fact that it's 160 metres tall in a different sort of way to the way in which it's one metre tall is supposed to reconcile a contradiction. So some objections. Um, well, these sort of temporal ways of having properties seem kind of mysterious. We don't normally think uh, when we use these temporal expressions that they're functioning as adverbs, that we're saying that, you know, Hyperion is one metre tall, tall in a Christmas day year 1200 sort of way, if we say that uh, Hyperion was uh, uh, one metre tall on Christmas day 1200. So it, it's a little bit odd. Um, more than that, I suppose you might, um, again, I, I suppose this is a sort of familiar objection. Um, uh, we, we've Versions of this objection have been made against all of the prominent views. Um, the objection being uh, about, or at least a question about whether it really accommodates change. So um, you might think that no change really happens on this adverbialist view. It doesn't really accommodate any genuine change. So rather, it's just permanently the case that Hyperion has the property of being 116 metres tall in a January 12th, 2022 sort of way, 
and of being one metre tall in a Christmas Day year 1200 sort of way. So nothing really changes. It just Hyperion just always has um, these properties in these ways. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, again, you might say, well, look, you know, we think of the world as changing and we, we ought to try to accommodate that intuition. Another worry about adverbialism um, is that we, we might just wonder about the coherence of adverbialism. So um, we might just you know, wonder, well, why should it be the case that a single object can be 116 metres tall in one sort of way and be one metre tall in another sort of way? What, why, why does the, the fact that these uh, properties are had in different sorts of ways render them consistent with one another? Because on the face of it, they look contradictory. It looks contradictory for an object to be 160 metres tall and one metre tall. So we're presented with this initial appearance of contradiction. Does it help? Does it avoid the contradiction just to say simply that uh, being 116 metres tall is had in a different sort of way to uh, the property of being one metre tall. Um, it seems that at least the adverbialist needs to do some work to convince us that this is so. Um, because, for instance, adverbs don't always serve to uh, affect this sort of reconciliation of apparent uh, contradiction or apparent tension. So, for instance... Um, I can't both be running and walking at the same time, it seems. Um, now, just sticking adverbs at, uh, in appropriate places doesn't necessarily uh, resolve this contradiction. So, just as I can't walk and run at the same time, um, I also can't run quickly and walk slowly at the same time. So, simply sticking different adverbs after the the run and walk and saying, look, I run in a different way from the way in which I walk doesn't resolve the contradiction uh, between running and walking. Um, so it's at least a question about whether temporal adverbs um, would fare any better in resolving an apparent contradiction. OK, so we've sort of looked at... Um, uh, Pergerantism and three different varieties of, of endurantism. And so suppose we sort of overall want to think about um, evaluating these sort of two broad traditions. Um, now, I guess some, there are some sort of additional considerations to the specific ones that we've considered so far. Um, Pergerantism sometimes claimed to have some support from modern physics. Um, we're we're going to go into this uh, a bit later in term when we consider uh, space and time. So uh, there's no need to worry too much about this now. But some pergerantists have argued that modern physics actually tends to favour their view. So uh, the, the, you don't need to worry about the, the diagram on the right of this uh, slide. It's a, a space-time diagram. Um, taken from special relativity. Um, the point is just that in contemporary physics, um, it seems that the distinction between time and space is less sharp than it is in traditional physics, in Newtonian physics, for instance. Um, and so the perjurantist could try to leap on this and say, look, well, you know, we, we know, we acknowledge that ordinary objects have spatial parts, and, you know, if the t distinction between time and space isn't so sharp as we might intuitively think it is, if physics tells us otherwise, then maybe it's not such a leap to suppose that we have temporal parts too, or maybe something like spatio-temporal parts, if the, the distinction isn't sharp. But this is something, an issue we'll come back to when we talk about space and time later in term. Now, I suppose a sort of general objection to four-dimensionalism would just be that, you know, it seems kind of maybe not as commonsensical, right, as, as three-dimensionalism, uh, that is, endurantism, uh, just because we don't ordinarily 
it seems, talk about objects as having temporal parts or as not as holy as or as not being wholly present at a given time. And you might the the uh, endurantist uh, endurantist might challenge the perjurantist to give a clear account of what temporal parts of objects are. Right. So what they've really done is merely give an analogy with spatial parts of objects, uh, and also an analogy with the temporal parts of events. But and maybe what we'd like is a really clear account of, of what a temporal part of an, uh, an object is supposed to be in its own right. How about three-dimensionalism or endurantism? Well, you know, uh, the sort of flip side of, um, I suppose, the disadvantage of perjurantism, you might think that it's an advantage of endurantism that it's more consistent with our ordinary talk and thought about objects. Um, so we ordinarily think, I, I suppose, of objects as merely three-dimensional as being a holy presence uh, at any given moment. Um, so this might be considered an advantage. It might be considered a more intuitive view. Um, on the other hand, the, 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 you know, there's potential rejoinder to this. So the uh, perjurantist might come back and say, look, contemporary physics, as we're going to see to some extent later in term, um, shows that there are just problems with our ordinary ways of thinking about space time, right? So it turns out that, you know, that maybe the sort of classical Newtonian picture is quite intuitive, but we now know that to be wrong and it's been replaced by special and general relativity and we've got very good empirical confirmation of those theories. And those theories imply that space and time is quite unlike how we intuitively uh, think of it. So you might think, well, you know, if our ordinary thinking about space and time is mistaken, it wouldn't be that surprising if our ordinary thought about persistence through time is also mistaken. So maybe just sort of common sense isn't much of an argument um, uh, to favour one of these metaphysical views over another. Um, on the So let's now turn some general objections to three-dimensionalism or uh, endurantism. So you might say, well, look, the this sort of notion, I mean, this sort of repeats the same theme, this notion of a spatially extended object being wholly present at a given time is kind of difficult to reconcile with modern physics, and in particular with uh, 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 this issue that I've said we'll return to, Namely, that the distinction between space and time is not so sharp in contemporary physics. Um, a second sort of general objection to endurantism is that, well, you might think that one good thing about perjurantism is that it has an account of what it is for objects to be diachronically identity, identical over time and through change, namely that they have... Uh, temporal parts located at different times with different properties. So it gives us some sort of account of what, what it is to persist identically through time and change. Um, but the, the, the endurantist doesn't give us such an account, doesn't give us arguably any account. It simply takes it as primitive uh, that objects persist identically um, across time. It simply takes this as a um, a given, um, and seeks to explain how it can be consistent uh, with Leibniz's law, but it doesn't give us any account of what it is for an object to be identical across time. Okay, so that's a sort of the end of our, our kind of general um, high-level discussion of uh, the relative merits of uh, perjurantism and endurantism. Um, obviously, there's more detail given in the, the, the readings and further readings, too. Um, and we'll return to some of these themes later in term, as I said, particularly when we talk about space and time. However, we're changing um, onto a, a sort of uh, rather different topic next week, uh, namely the topic of possible worlds. Um, so the key readings for that are given on the slide um, and also on, on Moodle. Okay, so that's it for this week. Um, thanks for listening, um, and I hope you have a good week, and I'll see some of you um, in the seminars. Bye.